Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. We begin by singing number 50 in our books, which is a version of Psalm number 50. God the Lord, the King Almighty, calls the earth from east to west.
Well, as we sit, we join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. It is, Lord, with great relief and with gladness that we come before your throne, the God who is majestic and mighty, whose throne is above every throne in this earth, and who rules in the heavens. We praise you, Lord, that only one name will be remembered all down the generations and praised forever and ever. The name of Jesus Christ, the King of heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You alone rule in the heavens and one day, O oh God, every eye will see that you rule over this whole earth also. And that is a great comfort to us as we live in a world of turbulence, of uncertainty, of change. At a time of great uncertainty and change in our national order and indeed in the world order in these days. What a comfort to remember that you are the God who sets up and casts down. That your throne alone is forever and ever. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes again afresh this day to see that reality. To see above the fog and the confusion of our world's powers and personalities and regimes and rulers. That you should remind us all today that we meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. And that we meet in your awesome presence. Remind us, Lord, who we are. Remind us to whom we belong. Remind us of the great calling that you've placed upon our lives to bring the light and the truth of your heavenly kingdom to bear on this dark world, to proclaim the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ so that men and women and boys and girls of every nation will come to know him and love him and find in him the peace, the comfort, the stability that we need in life and which can only come from knowing you and knowing the truth about this world and knowing its end, knowing its future. How we need to be reminded again and again of your great plans and purposes for us for all of your people and indeed for this whole world. So help us, Lord, we pray. Shine your light into our hearts this morning. Open our eyes to the truths of your word and let us see your eternal gospel and rejoice in your everlasting kingdom. So hear us, Lord, we pray. Draw near to us as we draw near to you in faith and in expectant hope. Show us, we pray, the glory of Christ and send us on our way rejoicing, restored, and ready for all that you have for us to do in this coming week. And we ask it all in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. Let me uh, warmly welcome you to our fellowship here this morning, and very especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, it's holiday time for us. Many of our folks are away, but we're glad always to welcome visitors, and uh, we hope you'll feel very much at home with us uh, as a fellowship of God's people here. Uh, we meet again this evening at, seven, at 6 30, and uh, you'd be very welcome to join us then. Terry McCutcheon will be preaching and uh, beginning a short series on the book of Haggai. This morning, uh, our normal Sunday schools and Bible classes are in abeyance for the summer, but we do have our Sunday school, our summer Sunday school for little ones, and uh, following the reading and during the offering, uh, you can take them out and they'll be looked after uh, downstairs. One or two notices to remind you about. Please pray for Terry. He will be preaching also on Wednesday at our lunchtime service at 1.15. Uh, that continues as usual through the summer, and I'm sure he'd be glad of your prayers. And uh, speaking of prayer, on Wednesday evening at 7.30, we gather to pray for Christ's work throughout the world, not just in our church here, but with our many partners all around the world and throughout this nation. And uh, again, with people away in the summer, it's all the more important that those of us who can be there are there 
to add our voice uh, to the prayers of the fellowship. So do join us on Wednesday at uh, 7.30. Uh, on Thursday, there is our summer program for students and internationals and young workers. They meet at uh, 7 o'clock here at Bath Street uh, for Bible study this week. And if you'd like to come along, you'd be very welcome. Likewise, on Friday, uh, our Iranian friends meet uh, here at 7 o'clock for uh, a social evening. We're alternating during the summer between a social evening and Bible study uh, so that we can keep the momentum of those who are coming. And uh, for our Iranian brothers and sisters, you're very welcome indeed. Next Sunday, our service is at 9 at Kelvin Grove, at 11 here, and at 6.30 here, uh, as usual. One sad notice, our me uh, member... Uh, Charles Simpson died this past week. Some of you will know Charles well. Uh, we're very sad about that. Uh, we don't yet know when the funeral will be. I think it will be after next weekend, uh, but we'll try and uh, keep you updated on that. And uh, I'm sure some of you will want to be there. Uh, and we pray for Charles's family uh, in this sad loss at this time. Well, we are... Uh, going to turn to our Bibles now and to our reading for this morning. Bob is going to begin a series in Isaiah. So we're going to read this morning in Isaiah chapter 1. You'll find that, I think, in the Visitor's Church Bibles on page 566. Otherwise, you'll find it pretty much near the middle of your Bibles. Long book of uh, Isaiah before Jeremiah, after uh, Song of Songs. And we're going to read together the whole of Isaiah chapter 1. So brace yourselves, because it is a bracing word. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate, as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of her sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. 
Though your skins, sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in her, but now she murders, now murders. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together as those who forsake the Lord they shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tinder and his work a spark and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. Well, as the musicians play quietly for a few moments, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. And the little ones can go to their summer Sunday school classes.
Let's pray together. The music speaks of the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we pray, O God, our Father, that yours would be the name that is hallowed and loved and cherished in our world, a world so dark, so in turmoil, so in rebellion against you. We pray, dear God, that your kingdom would indeed come, that your will would indeed be done on this earth as it is in heaven. How far away this earth is from the perfect will of your heavenly kingdom. Day after day, we're reminded of the truth of that as we read in our newspapers of the terrible things that happen relentlessly and repeatedly throughout our world. Another two dreadful suicide bombings in Baghdad just this day. The awful massacres in Bangladesh in these last few days. And so many other things to shock us and to shame us. But these are just the particular outrages of the moment that speak of a seething current of hatred and of determined opposition in the hearts of human beings to the will and to the purpose of heaven. But we pray, O oh God, as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come. And we know that your kingdom is coming and is even now being extended throughout this earth through the proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alone the great king, who alone is the savior who can rescue us and turn cities and nations and a world that has turned itself against you and bring it back to be called at last a city of righteousness and of peace and of goodness and of purity. Lord, we pray that you would give us, your people, this day our daily bread. You are so kind and so good to us. You have given us so many things to bless us in these earthly lives. You make the sun shine upon the unrighteous as well as the righteous. You give food and clothing and water to all those who need it. We pray, Lord, that you would make us dependent upon you, reminding ourselves that every day the very breaths that we take are ours only by your sovereign command, that every moment of every day is a gift to us from heaven. Help us, we pray, as your people who know this and who see the truth, help us to live the lives of commensurate gratitude and joy that every day of our lives might be dedicated to your service, to love you, and to make your love known to this world. Forgive us, Lord, our debts, which are many, and our sins, which so easily entangle us and prevent us from living as the people that you have called us to be. Each one of us this morning, O oh Lord, who is honest before you, knows that you are the one before whom every heart is open. And therefore you know all that makes us ashamed. Forgive us afresh, we pray, from our sins. And make us people who, knowing the joy of sins forgiven, are eager and ready to forgive also those who sin against us, how quickly we hold grudges, how easily we are wont to retaliate, how persistently we allow our hearts to fill with anger and with bitterness, and we forget the great love with which you have loved us and forgiven us and washed our sins away. Make us, we pray, lovers of your mercy. And lead us, Lord, not into temptation, but deliver us 
from the evil one who prowls around seeking whom he may devour. We're conscious, Lord, of our weakness. We need you so greatly every hour of every day. Guard us and keep us, we pray, from the snares of the evil one. Help us to know our own hearts and our own weaknesses and so determine to be strong in the face of his temptations. Determined also to help one another that we might live as a people to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to live lives of holiness and purity that do not shame him, but rather showcase his true beauty to this world. Yours, O God, are the power and the glory and the kingdom and the might. How we need you and how we need your power at work in our lives. So, Lord, as we come now to your word, would you speak to us that you might show us the way of salvation and lead us in it all the days of our lives, that you might equip us as your saints for every good work and through its instruction and correction and rebuke, through its challenge and comfort, through its warnings and its promises, you might fit us to be true images of our Lord Jesus Christ more and more in these our earthly lives that we might bring glory to him and gladden the heart of our Heavenly Father who has called us to an eternal weight of glory in Jesus Christ the Son. So hear us, Lord, we pray, and grant us your favor in this morning hour for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we continue in prayer as we sing number 527. Spirit of God, our hearts inspire. Let us your influence prove. Source of the old prophetic fire, fountain of light and love. Number 527.
Now, if we could have our Bibles open, please, at page 566, and we'll have a moment of prayer. God, our Father, we pray that you will take my words in all their weakness, that you will use them faithfully to unfold the written word, and so lead us to the living word, the Lord Christ himself, in whose name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've ever come across the Breton Sailor's Prayer. These sailors setting out in their flimsy boats across the vast spaces of the Atlantic used to pray, Lord, the sea is so big and my boat is so small. That's exactly what I feel like on the brink of considering the prophet Isaiah. My boat is so small and the sea is so big. Some of us survived Jeremiah, and Jeremiah, by the way, is a longer book than Isaiah, so don't panic. I'd like to have a look, please, at that sheet you should have on your, your chair, which I've called Finding Our Way in Isaiah, Finding Our Way Across This Great Ocean. First of all, don't panic at the length of the book. It actually isn't all that long. If you read in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message, and I'm going to be referring to that later, it's only 138 pages. We wouldn't normally regard that as a massive book. Also, a useful resource is the Isaiah by the Day, a new devotional translation by Alec Motier, the veteran expositor who has spent decades upon decades on the book of Isaiah, and he produced this recently. He uses a similar metaphor to the Breton sailor in his first commentary. He says, I feel like a very small mouse who has been given the privilege of, of nibbling endlessly at a very large and nourishing cheese. Very briefly, and this will save a 20-minute lecture on history, I'll leave you to read this, but he ministers for over half a century probably in the reigns of these kings mentioned, Josiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. It's very likely he lived on into the dreadful days of Manasseh, which you can read about in 2 Kings 21. Manasseh who undid systematically all the good, all the reformation that his father Hezekiah had, had achieved. And in these years, he very probably wrote chapters 40 to 66, which reflect on the situation. The exile, the northern kingdom went to Assyria, and he predicts the final exile of God's people to Babylon and their return. Indeed, this series I'm calling Zion's Fall and Rise. Zion is going to fall, and then it's going to rise. His theme's God-centered book about holiness, uniqueness of Yahweh, Israel's God, and the apparent eclipse of David's house and the king who is to come, and Zion, of course, past, present, and future, and the structure. I don't need to read that through. I'll try to divide the book into five parts. It's also been said that I have no personal experience of this, that you can eat an elephant if you cut it into slices. I've never tried that. But, so we're going to try and look at this book in slices, some of them large, some of them small. But what is, what is chapter 1 about? And I'm going to take verses 16 to 20, and in particular verse 18, as the key to unlock this part of the book. Verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. This is the big problem that spoiled everything then. This is the big problem that spoils everything now, the problem of sin. And Isaiah uses many words for sin in this chapter. For, for example, if you look back at verse um, 4, a sinful nation, a sinning nation, nation that keeps on sinning. These are the actual acts, the actual, um, the actual consequences of, of, of being sinful. And then iniquity, laden with iniquity. Iniquity is our sinful nature, 
that makes us commit sin, the kind of twisted, interned nature that makes us sinners. And then in, and, and then in verse, um, in, uh, later in the verse, they have despised the Holy One. They have, and in verse 2, they have rebelled. Rebellion is deliberate sins. Now, the prayer book talks about sins in three ways. Negligence, weakness, and our own deliberate fault. And we're all familiar with that. Negligence. We're not disciplined enough and we slip into sins that we ought to avoid. Weakness. We want to avoid sin, but we're not strong enough. Do you remember how Paul wrestles with that in Romans 7? The evil that I don't want to do is what I do. And the good I want to do, I don't do it because I'm not strong enough. And then rebel, uh, our own deliberate fault. We know we are sinning, but we persist in doing it. Isaiah identifies that as the problem, and it is still the problem. See, without sin, all would be well, wouldn't it? There'd be no need for a saviour, no need for holiness, no need for a Bible. We could just merrily go on on our way. So that's why I'm calling today's sermon, How God Deals with His People's Sin. There are two dead-end ways of dealing with sin. And we'll come across both of these as we go through the book. One is legalism. Legalism which makes us feel guilty but does nothing to alleviate the guilt. It tells us what we're getting wrong. It tells us what's wrong about us. But it does nothing at all to alleviate the guilt. Condemnation, disapproval, but no help, no blessing. The other way is the way of liberalism. It seems very kind, everything swept under the carpet, you know, the kind of, oh, we're all, we're not, we're all, we're all imperfect, we're not all what we ought to be. The trouble is, that is cruel as well, because nothing is dealt with, nothing is brought out into the open, nothing is confronted, nothing is, is, is faced. The bland, meaningless word, fine, covers us, oh, oh I'm fine. What kind of, what, oh, what a mess and a morass of sinning and weaknesses that so often covers. So how does God deal with his people's sins? Isaiah is telling us three things happen when we sin and showing us how God deals with it. First of all, sin means a breakdown in relationships. This is verses 2 to 9. Isaiah summons us to a law court, as Moses had done at the end of Deuteronomy. Remember, the prophets speak with the voice of Moses. There's no authority in the Old Testament that bypasses or supersedes that of Moses. And like Moses, we are in the law court, and the law court is the whole universe. Heaven and earth is the jury, and God is the judge. The whole of creation is summoned to God's court. Fallen humanity is an outrage in the world God has created. First of all, our attitude is unnatural. Children have I reared, but they have rebelled against me. Sin is rebelling against the loving Father, deliberately going our own way, trampling underfoot His laws. And it's a breakdown of relationships. The ox knows its owner, verse Three and the donkey, its master's crib. See, the first sin in the world happened not when Adam and Eve fell out with each other, but when they conspired together against God. And when the relationship with God goes bad, all other relationships go bad as well. And I think we can see that in society and in our own hearts. The relationship with God is the relationship that controls others, which of course is why legalism can never solve that, because legalism is concerned with rules, not with relationships. So the animals know their place, says Isaiah, but we don't. We are sinning away our privileges. My people do not understand. It's not just an emotional spasm. It's not just, oh, I feel guilty. That's awful. My people do not understand. And because of this, Verse 6, the whole of society has become a body, which is the sole of the foot, even to the head. There is no soundness in it. We are ill. We are diseased because we have turned away from the Lord. 
And the situation is desperate, verses 7 and 8. Whether this is the Syrian invasion, which is talked about in chapter 7, or the more terrifying Assyrian invasion talked about in chapters 37 and 38, is not the point. The point is Zion, daughter of Zion. The beautiful phrase, the daughter of Zion, or more exactly, daughter Zion. Lord says, my daughter Zion, she's flimsy, let a booth in a vineyard, a lodge in a cucumber field like a besieged city. Is this Zion founded on the rock of ages, on, with salvation's walls surrounded? You can smile at all your foes. But this is what happens when Zion turns away from a proper relationship with the Lord. Sin, Zion becomes self-sufficient. We'll come back to that. And sin erodes relationships both with the Lord and with each other. So you see what Isaiah is saying? Look, you've got it all wrong. You are no longer in a loving relationship to the Lord. And because of this, your relationships with each other have broken up. Second way in which sin manifests itself, verses 10 to 20, is with an obsession with religion. Now, Isaiah does not mince his words. Just imagine the anger of the people. Verse 10, hear the words of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. These people are judged as being on the same level as the cities God destroyed. That's why there's so much in Isaiah and the other prophets, the so-called oracles against the nations. Israel is special in one sense, but in another sense, that's, that being special depends on keeping open relationships with the Lord. You see, religion is a, very often a way of hiding the reality of what's happening. Because religion can and usually does place down grace, place down relationships. I think it's very important to realize what the prophet is saying here. He is not talking about idolatry here. He's plenty to say about that. Indeed, by the end of the chapter in verses um, 29 and 30, so about fertility cults, what he is talking about here is something far more subtle. People doing all the right things and congratulating themselves for doing all the right things and thinking that is all that matters. You see, all these things are God-given. The offerings, the Sabbath, these are God-given. Through Moses, God gave these and he appointed them as an institution for his people keep in touch with him. He's not condemning them as such. What he is saying is they have become meaningless charades because they've been divorced from heart to devotion. They've been divorced from real walking with God. Verse 13, bring no more vain offerings. Bring no more gifts of emptiness. A legalistic concentration on externals. Legalism always concentrates on externals, doesn't it? You can tell how many meetings people attend. You can tell what activities they're engaged in. You cannot tell what their walk with God is. And so how are we going to apply this? What's Isaiah actually saying? Is he talking to liberals, to the liberal church, and saying, Oh, you mouth your creeds, you say the things, but you don't really believe in them. Is he talking to, to Catholics and saying you spend all your time making sure you get your ritual right? You know, if I were to leave it at that, everyone would go away feeling happy, wouldn't they? This doesn't apply to us. But you know it does. And we've got to ask ourselves, not what is the prophet saying to other people? What's he saying to me? What's he saying to you? Why is we going to be like the Sunday school teacher who told her children the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Remember Jesus told that story of the Pharisee tax collector went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I offer the sacrifices. I do all the things that Isaiah mentions here. 
and the, and the tax collector stammered out the words, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then she said, now, boys and girls, we're going to have a little prayer, and we're going to thank God we're not like the Pharisee. Isn't it so easy to become a Pharisee? You see, we read the Bible, we listen to sermons. These are good things. But is it ritual or reality? We pray, but we ignore the sin in our own hearts. And isn't it so easy for bread and wine to pass from hand to hand without any real engagement with the Lord? And that's why verses 16 to 20 are so important. Radical forgiveness that comes through obedience and repentance. Satan is never more successful than when he tempts us with good things. Idolatry is, is a bad thing, an evil thing, and Isaiah say will come on to that. But it's how are we regarding the means of grace as grace themselves. It's good to get into habits of Bible reading, is it not? We need to listen to teaching. We need to pray. But it's so, so easy for these to become complacent. Yes, it's so easy. We can, we read the Bible we said, well, I've, I've read three chapters today, good, and tick it off. We listen to a sermon, so that's fine, and then immediately forget about it and turn to what really interests us. Sin is subtle. We need to be forgiven. I mentioned Eugene Peterson. Let me read to you his paraphrase of these verses. Powerful. By the way, Eugene, if your Bible reading is going stale, give yourself a dose of Eugene Peterson from time to time. He knows his stuff. He taught biblical languages for many, many years, as well as pastoring churches. This is what he says. This is translation of these verses. Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. I am sick of your religion, religion, religion. Or you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. That's powerful stuff. That is strong stuff. But we need to hear it, don't we? I certainly need to hear it. I, mean, I, I know the sinfulness and weakness of my own heart. I know it's negligence, weakness, and its own deliberate fault. They say sometimes when we read in an unfamiliar translation like that, the point, the point comes, comes home more powerfully. They are doing the right things. God wants them to do the right things, but it's got to be done in the right way. We all have mixed motives, don't we? Let's not delude ourselves. And Satan, if, you see, if Satan can't stop us praying, then what will he do? He wants, he wants to pervert prayer into a kind of um, unseemly interest in other people. He can't stop us reading the Bible. If he can't stop us reading the Bible, he wants us to be proud of reading the Bible, boasting about our biblical knowledge. If he can't stop us listening to preaching, then he wants us to start doing what Paul identified in Corinth. He wants to make a list of gurus. I have Paul, I have Apollos, I have Peter, and so on. Or if you're super spiritual, I of Christ. This is the real danger, doing the right things, but doing them with, a, with an, un, with an un, um, unforgiven heart. So, but, um, that's why it seems to me verse 18 is so important. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they, sh they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become as wool. Never in this world will we be free from sin. Never in this world will we be perfect. We cannot serve God perfectly, but by his grace we can serve him acceptably. And once we imagine 
that what we are doing, we've achieved by our own efforts rather than by the grace of God, then we need to hear this word. So, sin is a, is a destruction of relationships. Sin is an obsession with religion. And thirdly, in verses 21 to 31, sin is a collapse of a caring and compassionate society. Emphasis here, once again, on how the faithful city has become a whore. Daughter Zion, the bride of the Lamb, has become Babylon. The picture that culminates in the book of Revelation, the, the prostitute, Babylon, and Zion, the bride of the Lamb. And like, um, and like ruined silver or wine which has gone off, she becomes nauseating. All sin leads to self-centeredness. And you can see how that's what they do not bring justice to the fatherless, verse 23. The widow's cause does not come before them. You can see how this is happening. If I am the center of my universe, then I'm not really going to be concerned with other people, am I? Except insofar as it will help me and advantage me. I used to wonder why the 10th commandment says, you shall not covet. That seems so inward, and that is just the exact point. Think of the other commandments, stealing, adultery, murder. These are visible, or at least become visible. But you know, coveting is something that can eat us up inside, and nobody except the Lord would ever know. That's why I think Paul says in Romans 7, if the law had not said, do not covet, I would not have understood what sin was. I used to think any commandment could have been substituted. That's not the point. The point is all these others are obvious and open. They can be seen by others. And therefore, sin leads us to coveting, to me-centeredness. No number but one. No pronoun but me. No family but my family. No church but my church. Me, me, me. That's what sin leads to, a total lack of concern for others. Now, you'll notice the tone. The tone here is more lament than judgment. The prophets are continually using different types of oracle, different types of poem, and the tone here is of lament. How the faithful city has become a whore. The Lord is breaking his heart over his people's departure from him proud and complacent city like the church in Laodicea in Revelation, who care for status, who care for position, utter contempt for the powerless. Remember, the fatherless and the widow throughout Scripture are symbols of the utterly powerless and helpless, those whom society has turned its back on. And therefore, there will be judgment and there will be blessing. Verse 24, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, uh, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself from my foes. And then verse 25, I will turn my hand against you. Now, hand is personal. Some, some theologians try to water this down by saying the anger of God is something impersonal like touching a live wire. If you touch a live wire, you are destroyed. What they fail to realize is that the live wire is just as much a picture as the hand, and it's a terrifying picture. C.S. Lewis pointed this out long ago when he said, what advantage do we gain by substituting the picture of a live wire for the picture of, for the picture of outraged majesty? Outraged majesty can forgive, a live wire cannot. The hand that destroys is also the hand that saved. But if we start talking about impersonal forces, if we start talking about the kind of juggernaut that's going to grind us all down, then there is absolutely no hope, there is absolutely no gospel. That is why the gospel must talk about judgment as well as mercy. If we simply think of God as mercy, that will soon become God is nice and, it, and allows us to do all that we want, make sure the children have a good time. 
But there needs to be repentance. And now in verse 29 and 30, he's introducing a subject he's going to develop at greater length, idolatry. Almost certainly this refers to fertility cults, the oaks you desired. In other words, tree worship essentially, which is very often a, a type of worship in the ancient world. Trees with their fertility and virility and so on. And what will happen? Verse 31, both of them shall burn together. If we worship idols, everything will be burned up. This is not exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. Save, saved as one escaping through the flames, the works burned up. So you see, Isaiah is saying sin is dreadful, sin is serious can't be dealt with by rules and regulations, and it certainly can't be dealt with by sweeping under the carpet. But there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. In verse 18 again, though your sins are like scarlet and crimson, they're totally visible, not to us, but to the Lord. And how is this going to happen? And I as I here introduces another subject that's going to be hugely important. Verse 26, and I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards, you'll be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. How is he going to do this? He's going to do this by essentially the return of David becomes increasingly personal. The great King David, who in spite of all his failures and flaws, established the kingdom, he is going to come again, and a greater than he is going to come. We're all very familiar with the passages in chapter 7 about Emmanuel and the child who is born and the son given, the government will be on his shoulders. How is God going to deal with the sins of his people? He is going to deal with the sins of his people, whether they are sins of relationship, sins of religion, or sins of lack of compassion. He's going to deal with that by bringing a new, a new servant. I'm going to read about him much later in chapter 53. The one who takes our sins and our iniquities. He's not going to, he's not simply going to condemn as legalism does. He's certainly not going to sh sweep it under the carpet as liberalism does. He's going to bring in a new order, the city of righteousness, the city where real sin is forgiven by a real Savior. And that is the message, I believe, of Isaiah 1. Let's pray. And Father, as we think and reflect on the message of the prophets, we, we pray for the forgiveness of our sin. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worldly magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to sing as we come around the, the Lord's table. And bearing in mind what Isaiah has been saying, we're going to sing the hymn on the screen. This used to be sung frequently in my youth, but more recently I've heard it at student meetings, including our own Release the Word. It's not very good poetry, but it's very good theology. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Please do be seated. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ indeed be with you all. Dearly beloved, it's right that we should remember that this sacrament is a memorial of the great sacrifice of Christ for the sins of men. A memorial to us, but even more importantly, a memorial to God. We call him to remember his covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus. And therefore his promise, indeed his obligation, to forgive our sins. Therefore it is a true means of grace for all of those who believe in him. And it is a bond and a pledge of our union with Christ and indeed with each other as members of that one body. And so it is necessary that we come always to this table with knowledge, with faith, with repentance, with love, not holding fellowship with evil, not cherishing pride or self-righteousness, but indeed conscious of our weakness, conscious of our sins, and hungering and thirsting for him and for Christ and seeking his grace. When we come to the table and when we take the bread and the wine, we are taking to ourselves in a very deep way, in a very personal way, the message of the gospel, which, as we've heard, is a two-edged sword. It is the savor of life unto life. It is a fragrance of life. But it is also, as Paul says, the stench of death. It is the stench of death. It, if, if it is disdained, if it's despised, if it's treated in any way lightly, and so, in the same words as Paul invites us to the table, he does also warn us. He warns us to examine our own hearts truly. He tells us, yes, this is a table for sinners, but it cannot be for the proud or for the haughty sinner. It is a table for transgressors, for those with hearts filled with iniquity. But it cannot be for the unrepentant sinner, only for the humble, only for those who know that they have no worthiness of their own. But all who come like that with humble trust and a love for the Lord and Savior, and as Bob has said, no one can see inside your hearts, but you know, and the Lord knows your heart. For all who come with humble trust and true love for the Savior, we're welcome to this table. It's not my table. It's not this church's table. It is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he it is who invites you. And so let no one hinder you if you are humble and lowly of heart. Don't let your own heart hinder you from coming to this table because your heart is so conscious of your own sin. Remember that long ago it was said scornfully, disdainfully of the Lord Jesus Christ by religious people, by censorious people. Look at him. He receives sinners and eats with them. Yes, he did. And yes, he does. And he's going to do so right here today with us who are sinners. Because Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. So draw near then to the holy table and hear his words of invitation. Our Savior says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I am the bread of life, says the Lord Jesus. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And the one who comes to me, 
the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So hear the words of the institution of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they're delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as the Lord took bread and wine, we also take these ordinary elements, bread and wine, but to be put to this wonderful use that he has commanded of them, to proclaim to our hearts and to the Lord himself in heaven, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, to call him to remember his covenant with us and to forgive our sins and keep us in eternal life. So let's pray. We thank you, O God, for the message of this table, which points us back, back to the cross at Calvary, back to the day when the blood of Jesus was shed to take away our sins, to make us whole again, to set us free to grant that our guilt will be blotted out forever and ever, that we might know peace with God and reconciliation with you, our Heavenly Father. We praise you, Lord, for the way that it points us forward to that which is yet to be fulfilled and accomplished at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when at last we who have believed in him will see him in all his glory and shall be made like him. And the Spirit who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise these earthly bodies and we shall rejoice in his presence forever. And we thank you also, Lord, for the message it proclaims to us this day and every day, reminding us that you have bound yourself to us united yourself with us forever and ever, and that you are with us. You are Emmanuel. You are the one who has promised never to leave us or forsake us, but to be with us even to the end of the age until that great day of our resurrection in glory. So, Lord, as we come to this table, laden as it is with promises of your grace, Grant that we, coming humbly and partaking eagerly, might eat and drink and receive these good gifts with faith that is true, and so might know deep in our hearts the assurance that the blood of Jesus has indeed washed away our sins. Hear us, we pray because we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. According, therefore, to the holy institution and the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, we now do this. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So now as the servers come to bring you the bread and the wine, take and eat the bread 
And then if you would hold the cups and wait till all of us are served upstairs and downstairs and we shall drink together in communion. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, said the Lord Jesus. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We're going to sing as we close the doxology. You'll find it number 488. Heavenly hosts in ceaseless worship, holy, holy, holy cry. He who is, who was, and will be God Almighty, Lord Most High. Number 488. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.